So Joy-Con drift has been a issue with Switch really some day one. There, there appears to be a design fault with the Joy-Cons themselves. However, what if I were to tell you that uh, it appears this design fault might not be exactly what we thought it was uh, and that we now have a fix that might be permanent. Uh, well, we'll get into this in a moment. Before we do, I got to remind you, we are giving away a Switch OLED system. That's right. To win a free Switch OLED system, all you have to do is be subscribed to the channel and we'll announce the winner in early October. Now, there have been a number of people reporting on this and it, it seems to have originated potentially from a YouTuber called Victor STK uh, and then further explored in detail by Fantastic Quack. Uh, and we're going to link both their videos below. I'm also going to link uh, IGN's guide to this because they, they have a really good guide on taking apart the Joy-Con and doing this. I currently don't have drifting Joy-Cons, so I'm not doing this. Uh, but I've now seen enough people and know a friend that did it to confirm that this does appear to work. So the problem with Joy-Con drift, we always thought, uh, had to do with something that Spawnwave discovered when he broke down the Joy-Con. And that is this little metal pad uh, inside the controller that would wear down and get dented and then uh, obviously would lose connectivity. And the thing is, we thought that, well, if you just, you know, go in there with electrical contact cleaner, uh, it creates a layer over that pad, which fills in the scratches and dents and then enables the controller to continue to work. And this is a video I did a long time ago saying, hey, fix Joy-Con drift with electrical contact cleaner. And this solution still works, although it's not really permanent. Uh, the one time I did it on a pair of Joy-Cons that did drift back in the day, uh, I, you know, was, it didn't, I had to do it again like a year later and then like six months after that, clearly it was just breaking down and wasn't going to keep working forever, even though it did extend the life without voiding the warranty, by the way, of the Joy-Cons because you didn't have to take them apart. But it appears the solution, uh, now is you do have to take them apart, of course, which voids your warranty. But the big thing here is, uh, it appears that maybe the issue the entire time has simply been a pressure one. Uh, so the solution is so simple. You basically take a, uh, either a really thin piece of cardboard or say like a business card style card stock, uh, and you essentially cut out a square, put it on the back of the actual, uh, you know, joystick, joystick, uh, you know, encasing, and then put the, put the Joy-Con back together and the drift goes away. What this does is create more pressure, uh, pushing on the back side of of that joystick, uh, which I think stabilizes the metal. Now, I don't know if this is again temporary because it's possible uh, if the if the issue is the contact with the metal inside and this pressure just pops the metal out, the metal could still wear down or wear off at some point. I don't know, but it appears that this is a solution for even, this has been working even on Joy-Cons where the electrical contact cleaner and other things basically don't work anymore right like people have been doing it um you know to the point where hey i i'm doing the electrical contact cleaner every day and i get like an hour maybe before it drifts again well they went to this method and it just worked uh and if this has been the solution the whole time if there's just not a tight enough seal or enough pressure on that component because the component itself bows out or is just really cheaply built which is probably the real reason uh that is very unfortunate that Nintendo hasn't fixed it. Because if you think about it, Nintendo has fixed a lot of other little issues with the controller. Uh, one issue with the left Joy-Con at launch was it had connectivity issues. And why did it have connectivity issues? Because they ran the antenna, for starters, the wrong direction. And then they ran it across some metal components uh, that ended up just creating interference between your hand and the component and the antenna, leading to some connectivity issues. And they fixed this uh, rather quickly by just running the antenna uh, up in a different direction towards the front of the controller, uh, and that fixed all the connectivity issues. Uh, so if they were able to do a simple fix like that to fix you know, a, a very uh, you know weird oversight at launch, uh, and they were able to obviously add padding inside dots, to get rid of all of the scratching that was happening at launch uh, and even some of the warping that was happening with docks that maybe came out of manufacturing uh, that, that weren't exactly perfectly shaped, then 
why can't they do such a simple fix as adding something that would cost Nintendo less than like 0. .0001 of a penny to fix the problem? Uh, now, this is just obviously a more... Uh, th this wouldn't be a, a, a Nintendo shouldn't just stick a piece of paper in your controller, right? They could just make the housing a little thicker or make that, that bit of plastic have like a little extra, um, you know, on each Joy-Con, the, the plastic uh, battery encasing could just have a little bit of an extra um, millimeter of height or something like that um, right at that spot to create that extra pressure. But this is such an easy fix that we can do at home that I don't understand why... Nintendo themselves has just pretty much outright refused the fixes. Now, at this point, they have so many pending lawsuits over it. There's probably a lot of legal reasons uh, they're avoiding fixing it. Uh, but this is this is dumb. If this has actually been the problem, and it's been discovered now four years later that there just isn't enough pressure on that part because it's Boeing or whatever, that is absolutely ridiculous. And I'm sorry. We traditionally know Nintendo for making some of the most high quality uh, devices out there, right? Things that could survive literal falls off of the top of buildings. Uh, but this is very unfortunate. Now, Nintendo hasn't, by the way, always been perfect, especially with controllers. Now, you guys remember the, uh, the control stick on the Nintendo 64? Maybe you were lucky and yours never broke and got that white dust, but that was a very common problem with N64 controllers is they would break and get that white dust, and and yeah, at that point, um, that would be the controller you hand to your friends. Well, you use the new whatever controller you have, third-party or or just you know, first party controller. Uh, so that was always, uh, that was funny. Cause I remember in my house, you know, we had four controllers and there would always be that one person when we're playing four player games like smash, uh, that would get stuck with the really crappy controller. Um, and I'd always feel bad for them, but you know what? It is what it is. Just be happy. You get to play smash with me. Right. That at least that's what I, I thought when I was a kid. So yeah, I think that this is, Obviously, um, you know, Nintendo's had issues, arguably worse issues. I'd, I'd argue that N64 controller sticks probably a worse issue with how easy it was to break. Uh, but, yeah, I, I do think that uh, this is unfortunate. And I'm not okay that Nintendo has essentially not done anything about it. I think that Nintendo does need to be um, held the task that if this turns out, if we find out a year or two years from now that this solution causes Drift to never, ever return. That one, it's really cool we have this solution, by the way, so you don't have to go out and spend 80 bucks uh, to buy another pair or send them off to Nintendo and wait. You could just do this because when Nintendo sends you new ones, it's just going to happen again. So it's good that we have this solution, but also it's kind of bullshit. So again, throughout this video, I used clips uh, from IGN's video, clips from Fantastic Quack's video, and, and clips from Victor STK. If you want to see their full videos, everything link down below. And we'll specify that the IGN one itself uh, is the one that has the actual guide to doing this. Taking apart Joy-Cons, by the way, isn't as scary as you think as long as you have the proper tools. Not everyone has the proper tools like the tri-wing, you know, screwdrivers, and all that jazz. I happen to have an iFixit kit because I work with electronics, so it's not a big deal to me. Not everyone's going to be comfortable taking apart Joy-Cons. It can be a bit complex. I even think the IGN guide is a bit too thorough. I don't even think you need to disconnect the battery, to be completely honest. But obviously, for safety reasons, um, it, you know, you could disconnect it. Personally, I don't think the battery is powerful enough that you need to worry about it. But again, um, you know, they, 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 I, I would say the way IGN does it is the safe way to do it. Uh, but it's also a way that creates a bit more effort than I think you need to put into it personally. I've done literal shell swaps on Joy-Cons. I've replaced joysticks in Joy-Cons for other people. I've done a lot of um, little repairs like that for for other people's switches. So um, I'm I've, maybe I'm just not being fair here. But, yeah, to me, I don't think you need to quite do everything. You'll see what steps in the guide that you can make. Oh, yeah, maybe you can just set the battery on the other side, not disconnected. Oh, yeah, maybe you don't have to, like, do anything fancy with the antenna. You can just undo do you know the screws and just lift up and set back and you'll see anyways folks i am nathaniel robojant from nintendo prime thank you so much for tuning in and i'll catch you in the next video